and the occasional guest will dive in and pick apart the stuff that really matters most to you. We're too lazy to actually solve any of these problems, but we can definitely stir the pot. From schools, politics, parking in the fire lane, to those horrible people who drive BMWs. And here with this week's episode, live from the kitchen table, Tim Hamilton and John Frenet. Hey, it's the Maryland Crabs. We're back. And once again, we're up on the second floor of Middleton Tavern, looking at a wonderful city dock, uh, nice wind blowing, some the Mission Barbecue boat out in the in the Ego Alley. And a we, ticket in my car. Yeah. Weeks ago, we talked to Mayor Panelides, and we talked a little bit about what was happening with the chief of police and the city and some of the successes that he's had. And we did mention that he's running for, well... Rumored to be running for mayor. Again, he hasn't officially filed, I don't believe. And now we told him to loosen up his tie, unbutton the top button, and uh, we're going to talk to candidate Panelides because he's got some competition coming up to him in the next nine months in the city of Annapolis as he looks for a second term. Welcome back. Good to be back here. John, Tim, thanks for the opportunity. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> Too long. Ah, seems like forever. Seems like forever. So, so are, you're running. Yes, I'm running for re-election. Okay. And basically the reason I haven't filed yet is we're looking for a venue to do it. And as we look out the window at 110 Compromise Street, we want to do it over there sometime in mid-March, kind of highlight the accomplishments and a a big win for the city. Okay, so that's going to be your official announcement when... And is that the target date for opening? Uh, The target uh, date for the mayor time use is probably going to be sometime in May, but we just want the building in good enough condition to do it. Right, so it doesn't look like that horrible... Gray cinder block uh, with wires hanging down to the ceiling, and just <laughs> with banners tied well, to them and balloons. I, I tell you, it's it's, it's a long time coming. Um, it's been four years now; it's almost four years uh, since you've been in a campaign. You've raised a ton of money. Uh, he's nodding. Yeah, he's going to pick up the <laughs> bill today. <laughs> Take a little lobster, please. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean, are, are are you ready? I mean, you're you want you want to be mayor another another term. I do want to be mayor. I love the job. It looks it's great good. on LinkedIn. I'm just telling you. It's just <laughs> it is good on your resume. But no, I, I love the job. I love people. It's a, a fantastic job. And, you know, people ask me, why are you running for mayor again? And I say it's to build on what we've already done. You know, we've had three budgets without raising the property tax rate. We've uh, been able to build an Annapolis Renewable Energy Park. We've had great success downtown. And I look forward to building on that in the future. What's going to be? Um, I what? mean, you've, you've had, you've arguably had some successes. I mean, you've got uh, some things that have been put in place before you came on board, and you executed them and completed them, or have them on, well on their way to completion. Mm-hmm. Some were a total disaster when you took over, and you've been able to turn that around. What? Let's start off on the on the downside. What What are some of the down things that you found over the last four years? What? Where have you failed that you want to use your next four years to do? What is what disappoints you in your first four years? Well, bearing in mind that the second term second is awesome four. because you that's when you potentially any candidate can get things done that they want to get done that they don't have to please people. You you take the people pleasing part out of the second term because you don't you're not looking towards election. That's the I D G A F term, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, the one thing I would say is, you know, part of the reason I ran for mayor and what I've done and enjoyed about the job is meeting people. You know, I have an open door session once a month. So if I'm fortunate enough to get a second term, I don't think I would cut it, the public out of that. But you're right. You have to go to less events and everything else. But the thing that's been the most frustrating is how long it takes to get things done. You know, we alluded to it last time, which is I'm used to the environment of get it done Friday or don't show up Monday. And when you have to go through committees and commissions and everything else, it just takes forever. Have you acclimated to that or are you still in the get it done Friday? Um, yeah, have you, you know, pulled like them in your direction, or have you moved <laughs> in that direction? Well, I like to say I've moved in that direction. I'm still dragging some people with me, kicking and screaming along. But, you know, it's also for the best sometimes. There's a process in place. But the challenge is I always talk to people. They've evolved over time. You said, what's the most frustrating? When I came in, it was the budget, inheriting a $7.5 million deficit, getting out of that hole. How, how, are, how are we set for the budget now? I mean, I know you're not um, ready for a, a state of the city at this point, but I mean, sure. I, I mean, the budgets, you, you've passed the budget, you haven't raised taxes for three years. I mean, is the city in fairly good financial shape right now? I think we're in great financial shape, and it's not just me saying that. It's the bond rating agencies have also given us an upgrade as well. This budget's going to be a challenge. I mean, most of the money I have is going to public safety, hire new officers, pay for overtime, security camera. So it's going to be a, a tight budget in every other area, but a big focus on public safety. Now, we said I've we've always been not critical. Well, I'm probably critical, but you look at the size of 
Indianapolis government, mm -hmm. which is sprawlingly huge for a, a, a city this size. And there's been arguments that, well, we're a capital city. We have needs that, are, that, are, that other cities our size don't have. However, a good point that people would have uh, that, that counter that, saying, well, we have two departments that other cities our size don't have, which is um, transportation and uh, police well, and fire. Police and fire to a so, certain degree. So if you would remove those, then we'd probably be close to being on par. But it sounds like a lot of our budgetary con uh, constraints are go to those departments too. So I mean, not only do we have these these three departments that other that the county that other other cities don't have, but a lot of our, our budget goes to that. Well, you know, when you look at it, seventy percent of our budget salary and benefits. So the biggest thing is the cost of employers. And I'd say we got a great workforce. But you're right. Out of the hundred and fifty seven cities in Maryland, only two run their own transportation: Ocean City and Annapolis. So that's a big cost to us, but it's a vital service as well. Go on, look back into the election. You you going to win this one? I, I mean, feel, I, I mean, <laughs> again, again, I mean, because it's like, how do you say that without being too well, cocky? Well, well, so yeah, yes, yeah, I no, feel I, mean, I feel confident that I'm going to win the election. Yes, because okay. I think I'm doing the right things, which is you know you mentioned earlier raising money. So we're going out there. We're getting enough money to be able to get our message out there, highlighting all the things. We're knocking on the doors. I got great partnerships. I think more people are going to be engaged this time. You know, the first election was. I like Mike. I may not like his opponent, but is he going to win and should I come out to vote? This time I think you're going to have more people come out to vote. And I also have a record. You know, a lot of people took a chance on me because they said, look, we need him to kill the Crystal Spring plan, which, as we talked about earlier, has pretty much gone away except the Lutherans, the one tank compromise. <laughs> I mean, that sounded great. we got to remove everything except the Lutherans. We can't get rid of that. No, no, no. That's evil. Well, I mean, this, this senior facility, you know, one tank compromise street, people can look back and look at a record. And, as you know, you said, John, not only has he not screwed up, but he's done good things. But, well. And that, that's one thing that I've said. I said that I sure. think one of the, and, and this is going to sound horrible, but one of the, the biggest assets that I feel that you've got coming into this is that you haven't screwed up anything mm -hmm. really, really bad. I mean, you got that whole note thing that you passed our net early on in the thing, but that's. <laughs> um, but you know, I really, I, I mean, there have been, been some stumbles, but I mean, that's, mm -hmm. there's going to be stumbles everywhere. I mean, I remember when Josh Cohen had that big, huge snowstorm, and he was like curb to curb clear by March first or something yeah. like that. And it was, you know, whenever it was. But well, but and I'm, I'm going to say something that that probably precluded us ever from having Mayor Moyer on here. But I think that a, a lot of the last few years have been from cleaning up from that administration. Now, granted, the end of her administration ended in a the, the worst recession we ever saw. So you know, the, the, a lot of the problems we had. Is the city were, was something that was felt nationally, but I just I felt you know starting with the market house, um, starting with uh, the the money that was being spent, I and mean, she did a lot of great things. I thought her environmental co uh, actions and concerns were really really good. But I just feel that the last uh, you know I, I think Josh was put in an almost impossible position um, when 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 uh, he came on, um, and you know the recession still was going ongoing when you came on. And you know let's be honest about the last election that was a perfect storm. That was that was the equivalent to what went on, went on in the last national election. Yeah. Speaking, was, speaking was, of Josh, was, I mean, like, it, you know, being in impossible positions there, you've got uh, Save Annapolis that came out when he was yeah, on an Ireland a, trip. And <laughs> I've never seen a firestorm. This, the last election was crazy. It was just, uh, you know, it was, it was highly entertaining for those of us watching, you know, but it was, you know, it put convention on its ear here in town because there's a lot of different factors, and those aren't going to be here this election. Um, I think you're right. Um, but going back to the Moore administration, you know, Josh said, and I think she was upset, he inherited a fiscal train wreck. And, and he what did. I, yeah. But what I had managed. You don't need to think that she was upset. <laughs> <laughs> when I uh, when I managed Dave Cordo's race and we had looked at Ellen, you know, she had basically doubled the budget in eight years. Salary benefits had grew it a lot. Where have you and come from? I mean, you had a, a hundred and three, and you're up to like 111. Is that about right? Um, I think the first budget was 96, and we're up to about 103 now. Okay. But you have to remember, a lot of things happened in the election right beforehand. So, what's the biggest cost of government? Salary and benefits. Mm -hmm. Ten days before the election happened, they signed a collective that's bargaining that's agreement. Right, right. And they said all employees get a 10% increase. So if you add that cost into it as well, plus the one thing I will say that I've had to fulfill, you mentioned it, there were things set in place before me, but I had to find the money. We've increased the pension contributions because nobody looks at the long-term debt. It's so easy to say, I want to do something immediate, build a new rec center, if you will, but we should have been doing Main Street, should have been doing the bulkhead, focusing on other things. And the biggest one is land use. You know, somebody came to me and said, Hey, you got Crystal Spring, Preserve a Parkside, Rocky Gorge, all major land use issues that galvanize people started under Moyer's administration. 
and we've had to work and fight with everything else to get those under control. To get that there. Well, I think, yeah, so if you look at, you know, the, the pre, and I think that's the problem is that you can take credit for things that were started earlier when, mm-hmm. when you come on board, like, sure. like we said in the last podcast, but you also get stuck with a lot of the uh, the albatrosses, mm-hmm. albatross eye, that are albatross. hung around the neck of the okay. uh, of the city because, you know, you, you have commitments, like yeah. you said, you know, that collective bargaining commitment was made. Um, and I've seen, I, you know, I'm one of the wonks that, that, that watches the city council meetings meetings and I was you know whenever you have the budget that, that's presented I've seen you know older women older people who say that they will not support any budget that has even a single layoff I don't know how you can say that I don't want to see anyone out of work I really don't but I don't know how you can say I'm not I'm, I'm not going to even consider a layoff you know sometimes you have to do that I've been laid off I've had to lay people off that's just especially in, in an economy and I've always, always said that government's not a job program you can't just find p- p- positions for people and stick them there so I mean that's something that I've seen in previous administrations Administrations where you've had people who do see it as a jobs program, and that's not fair to taxpayers. Yeah, I mean, you have a difficult balance as mayor, but the one thing I'll say is we did do layoffs in my first budget, and it's hard. The hardest part of the job is laying yeah. someone off, but we did layoffs. Right. The size of government was extremely big, and we streamlined it. You know, most of the new hires we made are in the public safety arena. Are we right size now? Uh, I think we still got some work to do on that. Okay. I think there's still some more efficiencies we can find in government. You know, it was... Um I forget what I was going to say. You're so well, maybe I can segue back to your point segue, absolutely. from the budget. You know, when I look at it, I think one of the things I'm proud of is that if you look at my budgets, they're passed almost unanimously, eight to one, seven to two. And that comes from working with the council, meaning I can't get anything done without five votes. Right. And the council is broken up seven two in terms of the political affiliation. So I've had to work with people to get stuff done. And I'm proud of it. I think we've got a lot of things done. So we That's- said... That's one thing that that's exactly just what I was in, thinking about. You talked about the seven two council. Sure. How, um, I mean, you, you've got to fight fight to get a glass of water out of council sometimes, <laughs> um, because the only I don't want to say a sure thing, but the only sure thing is Fred Payone sitting there um, as as a fellow Republican. Uh, there is going to be a lot of turnover on the council mm-hmm. this year, and I know that both you and County Executive Shu have been lobbying to get Republican candidates running for that. But I mean, I know we've got. Uh, Alderman Lippman's seat is up, mm-hmm. uh, and I don't know of a Republican candidate running running for his seat. You've got uh, there's three seat three running for Alderman Kirby. Mm-hmm. Then I'm, and by the way, we were recording this ahead of time, so I don't look stupid. But yeah, there's yeah, like there, eighteen candidates coming yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. At, at this point, there's three three, three for Kirby. There's um, two in Ward Seven. Three in well, I guess two in Ward Seven. Ian has not. Decided. Ian says he's not. He's not. Um, but that I haven't talked to him since before the general election. So, so we have at least two there. Um, so uh, there's at least two there. Uh, I have heard that um, Julie Masag is going to be running in Ward Eight against Alderman Arnett as a Republican, uh, and she's a Steve Shue appointee that was her CFO, and she's now doing Anne Arundel Economic Development Corp. Uh, Sheila Pilleson, I believe, is running unopposed at this point. Mm-hmm. Still I've a little heard, early. So I mean, um, that th- I've heard mm-hmm. there. Uh, Dr. Classy Hoyle will be coming back in to mm-hmm. challenge, and that's going to be the one Ron to watch. Pindell Charles, that, that that Although she denied that to me, but I know politicians they've had a habit to lie into my face. <laughs> Talking about you, Mr. Leahy, at the <laughs> governor's office. Um, <laughs> You're never and, letting that go, are you? Yeah, no, no, that and my bike. Well, let, and, let's follow up on that uh, afterwards because I don't know the whole story but, on that. Yeah, but yeah, there's going to be a lot of candidates running for it. And right. it's this will be an exciting election. election. Yeah. But then, so that goes back to all right. So, like I said last time, is that there's there's an adversary relationship by nature between the mayor because we have weak mayor system mm-hmm. by design you know so you have you're a voting member of council as well right. um, so you have to get the five you know so you have to build political relationships political collateral um, and there's always been even with with Democratic mayors, there sure. had been that same sort of uh, adversary relationship, which is good. That's the checks and balances. Um, you being, uh, you vaulted into this position. So you, you had a rough start probably a little bit with, oh. with council. Um, do you think you've cultivated? They tried to strip my powers way before well, I even came did. in. But one of them, let's say. <laughs> but no, I, I think in terms of it, I think I've worked well with them, and I think we've got a lot done, and the results speak for it. But going back to the philosophy of myself on government, you know, I've mentioned a couple times there's 157 cities in Maryland. The one thing I'll mention is there's only four partisan elections. Only four cities in the state have Democrat-Republican. So when I talk with other mayors and other councils around the state, they don't deal with it. And I've tried to govern. Which, one, a, which ones are they? It's you know? Baltimore, Annapolis, Frederick, and I believe it's Salisbury as well. Wow. And all the rest are 
or nonpartisan. Nonpartisan. So you, you don't you're, run. You're running this Mike Panelides, not Mike, yeah. Republican Mayor Mike Panelides. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, I have a fiscally conservative mind on the way I manage things, but for the most part, I'm the mayor of everybody in the city of Annapolis. And I think I've governed that way. I mean, for you guys' point of view, have I done anything hyper partisan since no, I've been here? No, no, no. I mean, actually, I've, the only time, well, I've heard two partisan things. One, one was from, I think it was Fred when he was talking about laying off of AIDS or, or it, 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 was, it? It, it was about the, uh, they were cutting the budget and there was positions. And, and I think he felt that if it was a Democratic mayor, it wouldn't have been an issue. Um, this was a couple, couple election, a couple uh, meetings ago. You said you heard that from. It was on council. It was a, from it was, Alderman Payne. Yeah, yeah. It was That's and, surprising. Yeah, I, 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 I don't remember. And that, if I'm misspeaking, which I don't think I am, but it, and it wasn't. It wasn't a big deal. It was the first time I said, "Well, if this was a Democratic." But on this the other side, I heard you know a couple of years ago when they talked about shifting the election cycle to to bring it in line with the national. Uh, you know, Sheila had said uh, Sheila Finlayson had said, "Well, you know, this is this benefits. It doesn't do it, good for it our benefits party. our party." So I don't see a need to 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 move it. Now. I'm not criticizing them because you know, but uh, but by by and large, I don't think that that. Well, that, nobody really cares about partisan. I mean, you know, I, I don't I don't care how you feel about abortion. I don't care about you know any any of these national or even state issues. I mean, I want I want to know when my my sidewalk is getting fixed. I want to know when the potholes going to get yeah. fixed and who the hell's going to pick up my trash uh, because the garbage man didn't do it. And that's I, the bread and butter issues of the city, you know, and that's what people are looking for too. They're, we don't have that many partisan issues in there and I'm proud of that and you know going back to the other things we talked about in the previous podcast I've got legislation done working with people that have been in the pipeline for a decade whether it's mm-hmm. adequate public facilities the forest conservation act one of your one of your, your opponents senator Astle uh, we spoke with him about a month ago I'm mm-hmm. guessing and he, he he came out right fired about or a shot across the bow and said that you know hey you know well the the mayor does not talk to this council how do you address that <laughs> Well, the first thing I would say is, if I don't talk to the council, how do I get things done? Number Mm -hmm. one. And number two, I do talk with them. You know, I have to work with them in order to get five votes to get things passed. Obviously, each relationship's different, and we talk some people more than others. But I think if you asked every mayor, county executive, and governor, I think they would all say the same thing. They don't talk to me enough. We don't have enough communication. I said that in every organization I've ever worked for. If you ask anyone in the organization what the biggest problem is, without fail, everyone always says communication. Always. And also to that, you know, I I wouldn't expect him to say anything differently. He's trying sure. to divide it. Like I, I didn't expect him to come out and say Mike's great and he talks to everyone all the time. Oh, he's so. a problem. I mean, he's a scrapper. I mean, he you know yeah. he he's not. I mean, he's going to come out swinging. That's what. Whereas you know, we spoke with Gavin, and I'm not telling tales out of school because if yeah, you listen sure. to the Gavin uh, Buckley podcast uh, a few months mm-hmm. ago, you know, he's very laid back and he's he's got he's kind of a big idea guy where you know he has grand idea for what he wants to see changes why and he's very complimentary towards you mm-hmm. very complimentary oh, like towards that. John I mean, Astle guy, yeah. um, but he uh, but you know whereas John is a savvy uh, political fighter he's been doing this for 30 years so you know he's not going to hesitate to pull any punches whereas you know Gavin as a relative newcomer doesn't have a taste for the jugular he, you know mm-hmm. I think that he's going to be very very uh, measured with what he comes out Maybe, and matter of fact to be honest with you if you listen to them it sees that Senator Astle at this point seems a little more concerned about Gavin because in his mind he's got to get past the primary before he gets to you, so he was actually more focused on uh, the, the primary movement. I think forward. he should be, and I think Gavin's going to do better than most people think. Um, well, he's, I mean, he's, he's got some great ideas, and, you know, he's got... Uh, I've gone back and forth on this whole thing. Well, it's just, <laughs> you know, to, to me, I think, uh, you know, if, I think it was seen that, that his lawsuit was a thumb in the eye of the Historic Preservation Society, who I think do good work, but, I, you know, personally, I think that they have a lot of power that, that kind of goes unchecked, and this was Gavin's way of, of saying, you know, all of a sudden we're going to challenge this and see, see where your power lies, and I get that. I think it's an interesting way to launch a campaign, and really what the issue is going to be about is have I done a good job or not with it, and also what's your plan for the future. So you mentioned, you know, Astle being negative, and, you know, he's run for a long time. Well, not I'm, negative, I'm, but I'm going to say that he's... Sure. he's I'm not going to say anything bad because I'm not even sure he's going to run. He hasn't filed yet. But going to the point, it's about you and your vision going forward. You know, this election, you guys have talked about personality is such a big deal, and people want to hear your plan. You know, I could have gone out all day and said, Josh Cohen did all this negative stuff, but I had to present a vision. You know, what am I going to do when I get in? What am I going to do in the future? Yeah, That's so important for people to hear because it's one thing to knock them down, but they got to hear, all right, well, what are you going to do to close? Now, so Senator Astle's position, and, and just, you know, I re-listened to his podcast uh, yesterday before I came in just so I'd be, and, and Gavin's too, because um, I just like hearing John talk. But he was, 
he was putting uh, an emphasis on infrastructure mm -hmm. and that he feels that the infrastructure in town uh, needs a lot of work and that's something that's gone unaddressed for a long, long time. Whereas, you know, you said in the last podcast, give me $100 million, I'll fix everything. It comes down to money. What can, what can be done in, in priorities? Well, the one thing that shocked me, he said in the newspaper here too, is he talked about Main Street getting redone. And Main Street's in the budget to go under construction January 2018. It's been in the budget the last two years. As mayor, there's a number of big infrastructure projects we've done. First, I've highlighted is the water treatment plant, $40 million, the single largest uh, public works project in the city's history. We redid the bulkhead on schedule and a million dollars under budget. Main Street's getting done next year. Then we're doing Hillman. So John hasn't. It's going to come across negative, but not. It's never really been big in the city issues, meaning you talk, you watch every city council meeting, have you ever seen them there? So he's never really focused on those local issues. Well, so it's funny, I'm we talked to the, the governor because we, we asked him and yeah. said, do you ever kick back and just like, you know, look at, the, uh, at what's going on in city council? He goes, never. He goes, and because, you know, why, I mean... Yeah, but how are you going to run for a job when you don't... He said in the paper, he's like, well, I'm going to do a poll and then I'll come up with my position on what I'm going to run on. And I said... <laughs> you got to be talking to people out on the street knocking doors like I do. That's true. Well, I mean, he did say that he was looking to get out before the end of the session and get, and get knocking on doors and, and, and getting out there. Um, do you? I, and I don't know what this number, I probably should have looked it up, but the, the demographics on, of Annapolis are changing. Mm -hmm. And this year, I, I don't know what the Hispanic or the Latino percentage was four years ago. Uh, I'm going to venture to say that it has increased this year. Uh, there's been a large voice. Obviously, we've talked about the non-discrimination bill that is mm -hmm. about, uh, at this time we're speaking, is about to go in front of the council um, for uh, for that that was sponsored by Alderman Lippman and I think pretty much everybody else sort of signed on. It. And we've got a, the first Hispanic candidate filed for, uh, in Mark Rodriguez, filing for Ward 7. Five. Five. That's right. Yeah, and uh, I think that you're going to see a large Hispanic turnout. I mean, have, is that a is that a constituency that you have been working on that uh, supported you in 2009? When was it? 13. 13. Well, well, because the com the, the common wisdom, and I, I heard someone say this uh, recently, is that they were talking about. Gavin and someone, uh, someone on Main Street who owns a business says, "Well, the problem with Gavin is that you, you, in order to be elected, you have to get it's Ward One, Ward One, and and at a very close second, the uh, the public housing. They're the ones who elect the mayor, and and they don't and Ward One don't like business people because it runs in conflict with the way they you know, their lifestyle, the way they live. And you know, again, broad generalization. But this is to John's point. You know, I, I think the last election, though, I think the the and and that used to be a very good formula before. Okay, we need you know." Don't worry about five. Five will be five. Right. Seven will be seven. We need to worry you need about one six, in public one, housing. two, and and you know maybe you know maybe six. Um, and and I don't think that's necessarily the case anymore. Well, but but if the last election was was I don't want to say an anomaly, but it, there was factors at play that didn't exist before. Let's say that it reverts back to where it was, and you need Ward One, and you need uh, public housing. What we're saying, or what I'm saying, is is that all of a sudden, uh, if you add the Latinos into the mix and you get them to register and get mm -hmm. them to vote, you know, all of a sudden to your 59 votes point that you have tattooed yeah. on your back, <laughs> you know, that uh, you can swing an election with a couple hundred yeah. votes at this point. And, you know, if you, so let's say that you add 400 Latino voters into the mix, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and a lot of them concentrated in five, you know, all of a sudden, you know, th you're adding an element that no one's had to deal with before. You know. No, it's a big one. You know, when you look at the voter turnout, between a presidential, then it drops down for the governor, gubernatorial, and then drops down in the city, it's very low. And one reason was there was candidates that ran unopposed, but the other one was, you're right, one in eight in public housing have these issues that draw people out, whereas five and seven may not, may not. They're bedroom communities. I mean, they, they go to work out of the city. A lot of them don't even know what ward they live in. I'll bet you right. the vast majority don't oh, know what ward they doubt. live in. So, no, I think the Hispanic community does play a role, and it's one I've tried to reach out to. You know, before the Hispanic liaison the council hired part-time, I had one in my office, and I was the first mayor to do it. And even working with Roxana now, we go out, we talk to different people. I saw her earlier today. And she's and a, she's a Latin, the, we talked Hispanic, about that last Latina time, Hispanic liaison, liaison, liaison yeah. right? Yeah. I think it's important to reach out to the community, and I think they're going to be a bigger player in the future. How many of them are going to vote? To be honest, I don't know. Um, but I think it's important to engage them no matter what. They were 17% of the population, and it's only going up and up. Right. So it's going to be a, a bigger role in the future. You know, when you break it down to numbers, this is uh, apropos of nothing. I wonder what, let's see, I th how much do you think it costs to win an award? Like an older person election, less, less than twenty grand, uh, ten, fifteen. I, not even. I, I would bet you. Let, let's, let's let's call it. We, we we Tim and I have often talked about running it on nothing. 
Like, like yeah, uh, trying to, that. to run, run, run a candidate and just do it pure social media. I mean, I think Governor Hogan was a genius when he did his Change Maryland. Mm-hmm. And it was like, yeah, okay, this is a campaign. But let's say, let's you know, say, I mean, I mean yeah. all of a sudden. Let's say it's 10 grand for, for award. That's the high end. That, that's uh, the high end. And you're getting, what, 1,500 per award, something like, like or, or maybe 2,000 person people per award. So you're talking about what? Twenty dollars per vote, something like that. Well, you were your you, your spend last time was record, I believe, wasn't it? Yeah. So from the previous one on the Republican side, we went from fifty thousand to a hundred, and this year we're looking to triple it to three hundred thousand. So we'll probably be at the next filing report around one fifty, one seventy five. But that's, you're, you're not going to spend that. I mean, that's it's. Um, no, I plan to spend a lot of it. I mean, so I think about think about the number of, of votes that go to. What was the total vote? I mean, you know what? How much you won by? What were the total? Seven thousand nine hundred thirty four. Yeah. I think. It's just all right. Yeah, just, that, don't don't, think don't, about don't how do much, that math. That's how much <laughs> the, the cost per vote per person? You're, you're talking about. Well, I mean, this is this is not a hundred per, dollars per person. This is something that you see. I mean, you look. You know, the Clinton and the and the Clinton campaign was yeah. the most expensive campaign ever run in the history of the world. I think. So, Two I mean, million dollars. I, yeah. You know, you, you you've just got to do it. Um, and, and money only takes you so far. Right. I was talking about Anthony Brown and Governor Hogan, who was outspent, I think, $16 million to four because he took public financing. And I said, you know, if Anthony Brown would have had another $4 million to bring him to 20, would it have helped? Absolutely. Would it have been enough? Probably not. So right. money only takes you so far. you got to run on what you accomplish and what people want to see. And let's be honest, you have, you have a very limited... Yeah, you have a very limited option for getting your message out here. I mean, right. I have a couple radio stations, mm-hmm. a couple magazines, yeah. a crummy uh, little podcast. <laughs> so these are what you have to do. So, I mean, you can have all the money in the world and, mm-hmm. and you know, direct mail. I mean, direct mail is very powerful. But, sure. I mean, you know, after a while, you're like, okay, I, I only have so many outlets that I can yeah. th- that I can reach the 38,000 people. And right. I think even the last election shows that, you know, if I would have had $20,000 more or Josh – yeah, it could have swayed fifty nine, but it wouldn't have swayed five hundred and ninety or five thousand. So yeah, so that's where it gets to be very expensive um, per uh, person. Uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, but I mean that, that's when you, you know knocking on doors and, and meeting with people, meeting mm-hmm. with homeowners associations. Yeah. That's where it becomes a really big deal, and that's where you and and uh, certainly the Senator Astle, you guys understand this is the lay of the land. You've done it before. You, know, you have the experience. Um, that's where you know I, I like uh, Gavin. Gavin's an immensely likable guy. Sure. You know he's fantastic. He's got some great ideas. Ideas, but you know, does does he understand? Or does he have a concept? I mean, he said last time he was saying the right things about getting out, knocking on doors, and you know, but you know, because it, it might come down to that, you know. So, so when you're talking about strategies, you know, you're going to be running on what you've done and where you're going to go. So you have a very clear path to take. Um, Senator Astle, he's putting together his platform now. Um, and Gavin, uh, he's going to, ha- and if, I don't know if there's any other dark horses out there, but Gavin is, is going to be looking at business. You know, that, that's very important to a lot of people. So really the three visions that all three of you have are fairly different. Uh, and they're not opposed to each other, but they're just different interpretations of what you want to see in the city. Yeah, I think so. Um, it'll be interesting to see what Astle's is, but for Gavin, you know, the arts and the, and the focus on that. It'll be interesting to see how it plays with people, but, you know, I like them both, respect them both. They're good guys, and we'll see how it plays out in the next election. But again, I think it's going to be more about issues and what we're doing in the future than relive in the past, because you're right, there's not those big polarizing things where it's going to be, it's about this one issue or that one issue. Well, last year you or last year, last election cycle, you were sweeping Annapolis clean. You had brooms all over the place and uh, the big signs and everything else, and, and, and you did to to a certain degree. Um, I know there was a lot of criticism that you didn't sweep nearly as much as you should have, and you were methodical in your sweeping. What's your what's your campaign? Do you have a slogan for or a vi- or you know, going forward into uh, this year? You know, we've been going back and forth on that. It hasn't been finalized yet. We're still kind of all you know voting internally on what we think, but. You know, the top of my head now, I'd have to say uh, I'm running to build on what I've done in the past. And the fact that I've got things done, you know, we talked about it. Faucets, that building was closed for a decade. Now it's done. The Pocket Park was closed. Mich- Stevens was closed. Now it's a Mission Barbecue. We've had the Market House open every single day, and it makes the city money. We've had budgets without raising taxes. We built an energy park, which to highlight on for a second, is kind of a vision thing. Like, I've been a big proponent of we got to do big things, think outside of the box, be visionary. So we took a closed landfill, basically let them put 50,000 solar panels let, on top. Let everybody know where, 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 where specifically is this. Sure. It's off the fence highway by our waterworks plant. And basically what it is, they're going to put up 50,000 solar panels. The city's going to make $5 million over the next 20 years, creating green, green jobs, clean energy. We're making money. It's a, a win-win-win for everyone around. And the energy park actually returns 
power mm-hmm. into the energy grid. It does. Uh, into BG&E or whoever happens to be distributing the energy. Right. And then people buy it. So, for example, um, the school system is buying all in the county, the city, and other people can buy in as well. Right. And now this is uh, – when is that? When is this coming on online? Or? Uh, they should be starting construction hopefully soon. I told them that they have to have it done before the election because, you know, I want to stay <laughs> so down, that's down, that's down, that's down that's the solar panels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I need a gold shovel in March, and I, shovel, and, yeah, and, I, and I need a flag in November. No. Big scissors and ribbon. Yeah. That's, uh, uh, they're working hard on it. That's um, – what, what's your vision for the city in the next four years? I mean, we're – so yeah. the vision for the city, you know, as we highlighted earlier, is there's going to be a big focus on public safety, obviously, coming up as the number one priority. But also there's things in the environment we can do. There's different uh, stormwater projects and partnerships we can team up on I really want to highlight. And then the big thing we talked about earlier, people always talk about jobs, making Apple's business friendly. There's going to be some other steps taken to help us get that way. I talk to business owners. I hear their concerns. Expediting the permit process, you know. Um, I think what County Executive Shoe's doing is great, which is um, how he's streamlining that, kind of the one-stop shop, and also being able to hire third-party people to sign off on it. Right. I mean, it does make some sense. I mean, he's, he's, yeah. he's done a lot of good work, I think, on the county level. I think, mm-hmm. he's, I think he's had a couple of missteps as well there. Um, so moving – so you have environmental. Mm-hmm. And um, – what about business? What do you? What's what's your focus on on business? I know that was a, you know, business as if you will, uh, arguably propelled you into this office four years ago, yeah. um, with the kerfuffle at uh, Fawcett's One Ten Compromise mm-hmm. Street, the uh, addition of um, uh, you know Save Annapolis and Ed Hartman and and his group that did that uh, certainly helped you out there. Um, what uh. You know, what, what, what is your vision for businesses? Well, my vision, you know, when I grew up here, my family had uh, businesses. You know, my grandfather had the Royal Restaurant. My uncles had jewelry stores. So mine's to try to help people succeed in the business community. And part of that is working with our economic development team is to get out there cutting out the red tape going forward. The other thing I would say is helping them find employment. You know, one of the things I've done is a number of job fairs. So we had a great job fair with Maryland Live to hire 20 people on the spot. Um, I've done another one with Otter Woman Rhonda Pendel Charles, and we're looking at hosting the first Second Chance Job Fair, which is people that have gone through um, crimes and everything else, giving them a second chance for a job. You know, I was fortunate enough to be appointed by Governor Hogan to be on the Workforce Investment Board, and I serve on the Cybersecurity Task Force. So me meet with the people from NSA and talk about how do we help these high-level jobs. But I think it's everybody. You know, I meet with people in the marine industry, and there's a marine uh, job summit going on. How do we get people in those trades? Because every eight boats creates one job. So getting people in the marine trades, helping people in cybersecurity, helping entry-level jobs, second chance program, really trying to help the employment in the city is a big thing that I've done and I want to continue doing in the future. I tell you what, uh, why don't we get John get his water because he's okay. got to need to do that every interrupt every single podcast we do. And when we come back, I want to talk about uh, some wards outside of Ground Zero for a change because those always seem to be going unaddressed and to see what plans you might have for them. So, John, go get your water and be quiet about it. This is Governor Larry Hogan, and I don't always have time to listen to podcasts, but uh, I do enjoy listening to the Maryland Crabs podcast. This St. Patrick's Day, head to Union Jacks for the Shamrock and Roll Bash. Union Jacks has a blockbuster lineup of live music beginning at 2, with the Irish Rockers, Dublin 5, Weird Science at 6, and the Amish Outlaws at 10. Enjoy a complimentary breakfast from 9 to 11 at $2 Jameson's Irish Draft, Bud, Miller, and Coors Light Bottles, 9 to noon. Union Jacks, Shamrock and Roll Bash featuring Dublin Dublin 5, Weird Science, and the Amish Outlaws. Get your tickets to the Shamrock and Roll Bash at unionjacksonapolis.com. All right, so John's all hydrated and uh, ready to go, and uh, we got uh, and we switched to tea here, or to water from tea, because we're down to business. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, what I want to talk about, so I live south of the city. I live uh, just past uh, Ebb Tide, which is You're an interloper. Place. Yeah, so, well, I am separated from the rest of the Not a voter. You don't need to kiss up to him. <laughs> yeah, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> so I... Uh, 
we're kind of stuck because we live in the county, but we're separated from the rest of the county by the city. It's a really odd situation. So I, by default, so I say, I always say we, I have an Annapolis address, but I'm not in Annapolis. But um, so we are kind of like orphans of like Ward 7, Ward 5. So we are the Forest Drive people. And so I just know, like we said before, is that a lot of people who live in uh, on Forest Drive and maybe... Rao Boulevard. Not a lot of people live along Rao, but I mean, you know, but there's areas of the city that that they don't even know that what ward they live in. They're kind of disconnected from the city. So, in, in far as paying attention to the issue. So, like we were saying, while John was getting water, was Ward One, Ward Eight. Those are your your hyper involved. Those are people who, who mm-hmm. are immersed in the city politics and they know what's going on. They're hyper aware of what their older person is doing. Whereas I would argue that many people in the other wards don't even know who their older person is. Um, as a result, it, I guess some would argue that they don't get the attention, I hate using the word stepchild because it's so overused, but they don't get the attention that a lot of the other wards do. And in watching city council, you see that a disproportionate amount of the energy of council for a long time has been for Ward 1 and maybe Ward 8. Whereas you see, you know, uh, my I, I always said years ago that uh, I was driving along Forest Drive and there was two uh, two of those big bus shelters that were destroyed, shattered. Remember that? Yeah, they, you know, kids used to crash and, into and, them on yeah, purpose. And for like a week, they were lying on the, the the uh, sidewalk and the kids going to middle school literally had to climb over it. So when I called, uh, when I called uh, Department of Public Works, they're like, "Oh, we had no clue." I'm like, it, "It's been like that for for almost five days mm-hmm. at this point." Whereas I said, if that happened in Ward One, of course, you know, you wouldn't see it. Of course, it's a visible area, you know. Mm-hmm. But this long rambling preface is to say, when you look at other wards who have traditionally their needs have been downplayed at least, if not ignored, do you have any vision for reaching out to the rest of the city, saying, hey, "We want to pull you into the fold," you know, we want to pull you. It, those businesses. Yeah. And to be fair, when the ABA existed and I was on the board for there for years, those businesses were ignored by the ABA, too, because they weren't the sexy ones. You know? So to answer your question, yes. Um, I do that have wasn't even a question. That was almost that was just a soapbox <laughs> rant. Soapbox. But no, I, I do reach out to the other wards. And just to start with the bus shelters, we've replaced every one. And as we talked about earlier, the biggest challenge was just going through the process. And the federal government was involved, so when Josh was there, it was down for two and a half years. There was no bus shelters. Right. They ripped up the contract, and then they took all the bus shelters with them. So we begged, borrowed, practically stole from other places bus shelters. I think we borrowed some from Ocean City. We finally got through the process and put them all up. But I was I basically went in there and said, I want you to do this in the next 30 days. Nine months later, but <laughs> they're all up. I mean, it was unbelievable what to go through. But no, those are quality of life issue. So to get out there, I'll just take War 2, for example. You know, we had Travis Pastrana in the Nitro Circus. We knocked on doors for three hours in the snow, talking with people. And Ward 3, um, Rhonda Pendo Charles Ward, we did a meeting at Mount Olive. And we brought all the department heads from the city to come by there. So there was over 100 people that showed up. Everybody went table to table, round table with department heads. They complained, pothole transportation, they fixed it. And the one thing I found, which I find so interesting, is no matter where you go, you can live in a rich neighborhood, poor neighborhood, white, black, old, young. People complain about the same things. Mm-hmm. So sitting in a Ward 1 meeting, at a Mount Olive meeting, people complain about cars parking on the street that shouldn't be there were cars. Okay. Same thing down here. Too many people parking close there. So it's like the same issues. We're not as different as we are disconnected. You know, I speak at community groups all over the place, which is fascinating. But for the rest of it, you know, the issues they care about are their roads getting fixed, having a clean environment, and not raising their taxes. So there's not really specific things that galvanize some of the other neighborhoods, per se. Well, because John's got a good point. Those tend to be bedroom communities. I mean, Forest Drive is heavily trafficked because people are on their way out during the morning and the way back in the afternoon. Um, Whereas, uh, you know... this is ward. This is the playground. This is mm-hmm. Ward One for 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 a certain oh, both, extent. Both for residents and visitors as well, uh, alike. There, what do you think is the trickiest ward to, to pin down? Who's what? The, the trickiest ward. I, I would say like Ward Eight. When you talk about gentrification, I ward, think Ward, ward Eight. Ward, Actually, I think I think Robert Fidel Charles. Well, she's got a, a a fairly heavy. She doesn't have. I don't believe she has any public housing. Is that right? Hold on. No, you're right. Uh, okay. I think she has some subsidized housing there off of Admiral Drive, but I don't think she has any public housing. You're right, because that is private, yeah, for Admiral. Those two properties. Yeah. She's got a you know a fairly affluent African American community in there. She's got some middle class African American communities there. I was talking to her, she said shockingly to her, 
she has 750 businesses. Yeah, you don't think <laughs> that when you when you look at that, and, and, and you don't. But you you got to think about the, and I think we've talked about this before. The the dentists uh, that are in in the, in the little oh, yeah. thing or the. Well, that was my argument too. Is if you look at city business, the obvious children were sitting at Middletons, and and you know I'm looking over the Chipotle right now, and, and looking over at uh, um, you know Mangias, and these are all the obvious children. But but a very tiny percentage of the city businesses are actually downtown because you're right. There's lawyers and attorneys, and if you go over to West Annapolis, that's where you know the dentists and architects, and I mean, it's just the whole entire city's like. That. I mean, we're, we're Where's your where's your campaign going to focus? I mean, we we briefly touched about saying that there was a, a formula at one point that you need yeah. more, one eight and six. Um, where's your campaign going to focus on? I mean, are you going to focus on any specific wards now? I guess that's a really stupid question because it was John. Then, then the quarterback then, giving away the playbook. Yeah, no. But no, what, they, what are all your secrets? But I mean, that, that, that's just going to make you say that who you're going to ignore. But that's not what I was getting, <laughs> getting yeah, at yeah. either. And I understand what you're saying. No, it's kind of the same formula we used last time, which is we're going to have a great social media campaign. You know, we had great signs you mentioned earlier with the broom sweeping apples clean, 40 big billboards. I'm going to walk on the doors. We're going to have a great direct mail campaign. And we're going to focus on each community addressing their issues. So when people come to my open door session once a month, like I know what's going on in the wards and things they care about. And people write to me all the time. So I think I have an advantage being in office. They talk about the power of incumbency because I've been able to help a lot of people. And I also hear what their concerns are. And you don't necessarily get that just as a candidate. How do you how do you as you go into campaign mode? How does that jibe with um, your mayor time? Uh, you know, I, I mean, you know, we we can't talk mayor and campaign type things. Mm-hmm. I know I I can't call your office and say, hey, let me know about the uh, you know where's the check for the campaign or what you know I, you know I can't do any of that. Yeah. How does how does that? I mean, from a I guess a a legal standpoint, how does that work? I mean, do you yeah. take time off? From the so, no, it's interesting because the one thing I found is you're never off for mayor. It's 24-7. So if it's snowing at 5 o'clock in the morning, they're calling you. If you're at the gym working out, somebody wants to talk to you about that. You're at the grocery store. So you're always on as mayor. On the campaign side, you know, there's a lot of – I'll give an example. We were talking about working 60 hours a week. I think it was last Thursday. I spoke at the Chamber of Commerce at 730 in the morning. And then from that, I went to a Rotary Club at lunch, spoke to them. Then the Eastport community – at 7.30 at night. So by the time I was done, it was like a 14-hour day. But you could consider any of those campaign, and you could also consider mayoral duties because I was invited to speak. So a lot of it overlaps, meaning the accomplishments I tout as mayor are the same as the campaign. Well, that's we, we had to sit down because we, we said that we want to talk to you as mayor. Sure. And then a, you know, a couple weeks later, we want to talk to you as candidate. And when you know John put notes together, I put notes together, and we're looking at it, it's really hard to differentiate what is the topic for mayoral, uh, the mayoral, mayoral yeah. interview and what yeah. is for the candidate interview because they all kind of overlap. Will you be hosting? I mean, you've got, as, as mayor, uh, when you tighten up your tie and button that top thing, you've got – your open open door policy and your open door uh, monthly things. Are you going to have something like that as a candidate? That uh, hey, I, I, I'm I'm a voter here and I'm pissed off about something or other, and I uh, want to talk to you about it. Or is that where I'm going to be talking to you as mayor? Or um, I mean, I, or maybe there's not a difference. I don't know. Yeah, because I. To be honest, I don't think there is. You know, we've done that. You know, going door to door, but also if people host meet and greets, they did in the past and they'll do it in the future. So you say. I guess after work with most people, hey, from 5 to 7, I'll be at so-and-so's house. Come talk to me about whatever you want. So it is kind of both, and you're always on in this job no matter what you're doing. So looking back at your first term, you know, you still got nine months left in this. But, I mean, uh, you look back at, you know, the first year, there's probably times you're like, oh, why did I do that? Or why did I do this? Or, you know, you're going to be highly critical of yourself. But, but, you know, you, you, as you gain confidence and you understand the system and you understand the players and you understand the relationships and build all that, moving on to a second term, what would you different, do differently than you would during your first term? It's not necessarily what did you screw up or what did you, mm-hmm. what did you saying, all right, I used to think that I could do this, and now I found out, you know, you, you have to build this coalition here, you know. I think understanding the powers of the mayor and doing things more quickly. We, you know, we talked about in the last podcast, inspecting all the hacky units going in there and treating the residents the same as everyone else. You know, that was mentioned in my transition team, but I was very cautious about how is this going to play? Do we have the right legal authority? And now that I've been in here and I understand the role to say, yes, I can do this. Or you know what? I'm going to put this forward because everything we do takes a long time. You know, we're looking out at 110 Compromise Street under construction. That legislation took almost a year right. to go through. You look at adequate public facilities, the Forest Conservation Act. So really, you know, pedal to the metal all the time moving forward and then just not letting up, which I think I've done. Um, the other thing is I try not to get in big controversial fights. You know, people have brought things up to me and I've said, 
not interested in doing that. It's going to cost too much, but just building that coalition and getting it done. So I don't really have a big major regret in terms of policy that I've done. Maybe not policy, but even like, well, let's take a different tack sure. on this. Let's say that, uh, you know, you're going to, we said in the last, uh, in, in the last podcast is that, you know, your second term is when you can really get things done because you're, you're, you're out of campaign mode and it doesn't matter if you tick people off. It's not to say that you're, you're, you're moving forward with wild abandon, but you can take risks that you really couldn't during the first, f- during the, the, the first term. What things could you tackle at that point? You know, and it's difficult in, in a campaign position, but I mean, you know, or maybe a better way to say this is if you knew that you had, like you, there's something you can't get the votes for. But you that you could change, but that you know that you're not going to be able to, to change because you don't have the votes. What would it be? For example, hmm. if I were mayor, I would look at the size of the uh, city city uh, employees, uh, city employment, and I would reduce it, waving a wand saying I could do it. Could I do that as mayor? No, I could never do that because you'd right. never ever get that through council. You know. So what's something that that you would like to do, but it's just you're constrained because it just could never happen realistically. No, that's a great question. I know. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to think. And obviously, you know, reducing the size of the government, we did that in the first budget with some layoffs, and I think there's still some more work to be done. But I also kind of like the fact that you do have to work with the council because I think it brings balance. I mean, I don't know if there's one thing, because I think about it if it was, you know, Forest Conservation Act. Um, well, there's you know, a balance, but it doesn't always mean yeah. that, that it's right. Like, you know, for example, you know, you can be constrained from doing something that would be for the best interest of the uh, of of the city just because you couldn't get enough votes. It doesn't mean that they were right. You know, there's been a lot of things that council have thwarted yeah. you on or Josh on and even Ellen that, that I'm like, that that was the wrong move, but they just mm-hmm. didn't have enough votes for whatever reason it is. And it's not to say that, that the council was wrong. It was just that they had interests that were diametrically opposed to what you wanted. So there's certain things that I'm certain that you would want to do. That, that Josh would have wanted to do, yeah. or or that Gavin or or, or John would want yeah. to do, but they can't because they can't get past council. And like you said, that's a check and balance, and that's a healthy thing to have. I think, but some, it's not always in the best interest of the of the citizens. No, I think you're right. And then sometimes there's certain members that put the interests of the employees maybe above the interests of the entire. Staff. I would agree with that. Um, so I think changing some of the HR. And, but they're doing it for the right reasons. I sure. mean, but but I, I disagree uh, for the for the health of the city. They're putting they're putting a very small uh, number of people's interest ahead of those of the taxpayer. I understand why they're doing it. I happen to disagree with them doing it, but I but I, I know why they're doing what they're doing and they think they're doing the right thing. Yeah, so to to dive into that deeper, you know, I'll say we have great employees in the city. But looking at some of the HR rules and procedures on accountability and effectiveness or even firing somebody, you know, it's almost impossible to fire anybody from government. And exactly. I'll give you an example, um, we had fired someone because they were in public works and they hit three other cars, bragged about it on social media, don't worry, the city will pay. We terminated them. The Civil Service Board brought their employment back. So there's HR rules that need to be complete. Like if I could wave a wand, I would say, first of all, you can't get like a hundred strike policy. You can be fired for not doing this. Well, and there's and that, sounds, this that sounds like an Annapolis podcast question. <laughs> you could be mayor for a day and wave a right. wand. Yes. Well, but there's, yes. there's a bureau, and that's I think that's the complaint that everyone has. And I, if I were if I were a suddenly elected mayor, and I would think I'm going to clear the way of all the bureaucracy, and you found out you can't, mm-hmm. uh, because that is that's greater than any any the, the power of bureaucracy is greater than that of the of that of mayor. Uh, you know, so to that extent is if you go to let's say the rec center and there's a zillion people working there and that you know they're all good people they all you know, they all need their jobs but you look and say well there's an inefficiency to this and you but the bureaucracy takes on a life of its own where they shrug and go yeah but you can't let anyone go it just whereas yeah. in the private industry no, like you said if you don't do your job yeah. or, or there's no need for your job then you're eliminated and I, I just, i've come from two places i worked at the baltimore sun and i remember i was on my uh fourth manager and third pay structure in the course of a year they were chapter 11 then i worked for a software company vocus and they laid off like half the staff like it happens but it's not so much about layoffs it's more about accountability and making people do things because you should never get the answer it's not in my job description and again not everybody most people are good but there has to be a way to hold people accountable to make them do things and if they're not doing it to find somebody who will. For example, and then this is anecdotal. I have no proof behind this. And this goes to the county level: is that I knew a lot of business owners that during the recession, that they uh, they were restaurateurs and they were opening businesses, and they had zoning. Uh, the county zoning was anecdotally. They said that they were getting a lot of flack from them. That there, there was there's a lot more activity. There's more inspections. There's more. Mm-hmm. Now the argument I heard, and again, well, I got to cover myself. I have no proof for this, but the argument was that during the recession, less businesses were opening, so you had a lot of people who had to look for work to do with 
the county because they're afraid of layoffs. Um, so so they, were, they were concentrating on, on generating paperwork. Now, I don't, I'm not saying I believe it or I disbelieve it, but I understand that in general is how bureaucracy works, and that's very frustrating when you own a business. So Sure. I mean, you know, the, at the county level, I have to look into it, but, you know, they're not getting paid off commission in the city. Exactly. So it's not like... I don't see them going out every day and saying I'm going to find a hundred people. To no, no. To. But but I mean, you know, when you talk about preservations of jobs, and and you know, my, I I know a lot of, of government employees personally, and they're all very hard workers. Mm-hmm. You know that that's so I don't want to see them out of work. But I mean right. that that to me is what we're you, well, I as, agree with a, you. as I mean, a taxpayer. My, uh, both my parents started out as teachers. My dad taught history at Annapolis. My mom taught Spanish. My brother worked for the Social Security Administration. This is like the first government job I've had. But <laughs> now there's a lot of good people. <laughs> You're just there. bragging. It's first job I had, mayor of Annapolis. Mayor of Annapolis. <laughs> <laughs> Segway from there. No, um, your mother is your mother. Is your mother Greek too? She is Greek. Yep. So the Greek, Greek speaking Spanish teacher. That's right. <laughs> that is a tight. That speaking. How about that? Hey, do you do you enjoy campaigning? I do. I enjoy it a lot. Well, I'm a people person. Right. You know, I I, um, I enjoy being around people. You know, part of the reason the open door, but also just being around the town. And I, I was joking earlier. They said like, "What's the worst part?" I said, "I don't mind if people talk to me in the grocery store. I don't care if they talk to me on the street or if we meet at dinner." But the gym is like my one sacred place. And I've had people put, like get in the pool and start to talk to me. And I'm put, like, hey, put, man. Put the, put the, hood, put the hoodie up and put the earphones. I do, I do the same I do. thing I put at, earphones, at yeah. the rec center. Put the earphones in. I just want to do my laps yeah, and, wanna, and let me go. I want to um, pump iron and not be bothered. So please, um, that's my only request. The, the campaign last year, or last, I keep saying last year, but last time, uh, didn't get real ugly. But there were there, it had its moments. Um, I would say they took more shots at me than I did at them by far. I, I, I agree. Um, I would think that now you're going against a uh, very savvy opponent. I don't, you know, it remains to be seen how it is in, in Senator Astle, mm-hmm. who's run. He's, he's seasoned. Know, yeah. Even though how many elections he's got. Right, I, right. I know he's I, he's a target on a billboard down here on the on the side. Oh, of the I've, got to look I've, got, that. I've got to I've got to check that out. But, you know, are, are you expecting a negative campaign? Are you is that are you going to eschew? negative campaigning or maybe keep that in your pocket? Uh, so for the most part, you know, I don't think I have to go negative on the campaigning. I can stay positive and talk about my record. If the election's about, did Mike Panelides do a good job the last four years? I think I win. I think they'll try to bring up negatives and other things to distract from it, but I can always pivot back. So if you talked about anything about, say, being inclusive in the African-American community, you know, I could look back and say, Yes, my grandfather's had the first restaurant to desegregate. You know, well, what have you done? Well, I hired the first African American liaison, um, Larry Griffin. People love him; he's fantastic. We get out there talking Larry's to people, awesome. right? Uh, what have you done for culture? We had the first Martin Luther King Jr. parade. What have you done? We had the 150 Emancipation uh, Proclamation, celebrating some of our African American history right. that goes on. Which, as we all say, African American history is American history. You know, we also did the hack inspections. You know, putting up bus shelters. We went in there and treated all the residents the same. So I could look back in four years and say, here's the four things I did. Then you could go to John and say, well, Senator Astle, you've been in office for 30 years. What are the 30 things you've done? So I think for him, his challenge is he's going to have to quantify the things he's done over time and do a compare and contrast. And, and it's, it's also going to be a little bit of a uh, apples and oranges type thing because he's been operating off of a state level as opposed to uh, yeah, but uh, I, the state I, level. I, I disagree with that a little bit. I mean, if you think about it, I got a million dollars from Governor Hogan for flood mitigation to mm-hmm. understand how we're going to fix flooding downtown. He could have done that for the last 30 years if he wanted to. True, true. true. So you ever seen any dark horses coming out of are, are um, we talking about this is campaign as it's going to be? Yeah, on the Republican side, um, I don't think I'll have an opponent. Um, the one thing I did hear is they're going to pay somebody to run against me, which basically is try to make me bleed resources in the primary Who? and everything else. The Republicans? No, 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 the oh, Democrats. Uh, okay. So they either get a Democrat to switch to Republican or they would just find somebody to run. No chance of winning, but, you know, make me bleed money and everything. There has been. I'm going to say I'm going to throw it out because there, no one ever points this out. There has been some nasty shit that's gone down in the elections previously uh, that have been really, oh, really. Oh, I mean, you, I mean, mean did the not, Scott Bowling. Yeah, oh, yeah. Scott, Bowling, Scott Bowling, exactly. Bowling, Fred and, Payone, he was the yeah. Tea Party candidate mm-hmm. last year. Yeah, there, there's there's been some really nasty stuff uh, that that's going on that has been uh, beyond negative campaigning. It's been um, it's been really dirty, and I, I've I've never seen the central. I understand committee. that operatives living in Chicago. Now, yeah, well, so that may not be. A, yeah, and <laughs> no, I've, I've never. 
never seen the Central Committee, this Democratic Central Committee, spank this guy, and and uh, you know for what it's been done because I think that he's done the dirty work that that some people well, won't I, do I had on their own. When Josh Cohen, uh, I never lost, death threats involved. Well, you know, when man. Josh lost the primary and Zeno had won it, and then Zeno had backed out of it, uh, they had this. Okay, we're going to interview these people and name them. And I, I went to the media, and it was just amazing. It was like uh, I, I think Trudy McFall was there. There were several people there pitching their case for why it was like. Um, okay, just got, yeah, okay, Josh, cool. I was like, it was, it was like that. Quick. I was like, well, okay, I see, I see how that goes. But what, what, what is the, what does the future hold? Okay, you got nine months left. Uh, you can have a baby between now and the election. That'd be good um, for the election. That looks yeah. good. <laughs> another, another baby <laughs> Jason hold on there. So um, you, you, you can have a baby between now and the election. Then you've got another four years. Uh, and then, then you're done in Annapolis, in, in the city of Annapolis. Now we're looking long, long term. Yeah. So, you know, I've always told people, what do you do after mayor? And the one thing I say is, you know, I want to go back to the private sector. You get appointed in the USDA. and <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that could work. But, no, I want to go back to the private sector. But I want to stay involved in local politics. And I think you can do that. You know, there's offices that are part-time, whether it's county council, delegate, senator. So going back to the private sector, you know, for some financial reasons, some because I just kind of miss what I did there. But always staying involved. The point earlier... I would never take another executive job because it wouldn't be fair to your family, meaning every night, every weekend, speaking at chamber breakfast in the morning. I don't think I want that lifestyle having a family and kids, but I want to stay involved in another way. You got a family and kids on the way? You're a sing, 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 young, young single guy, mayor, mayor, mayor of Annapolis? <laughs> uh, I have a girlfriend now, but uh, no, no kids. But you know, So you're going to declare it? You're declaring your candidacy. You're declaring your your proposal right here. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I shouldn't have said it like that. We've had that part. <laughs> no, no, yeah. no, no. We're not doing any editing. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say this. Yes, in the next five years, I want to be married and have kids. Um, so, and this lifestyle of being mayor, which is every night, every weekend, people bombarding yeah. you, it's not really accustomed to that. So, I want to be involved in politics, have a regular full time job in the private sector. I never understood. I've never run for anything because it's easy just to take shots from the side, and it's a lot more fun. Uh, but the people, you you work hard, you don't make any money, and you just take a shitload of criticism from people. That always kind of amazes me that, that yeah. people work so hard for that. Well, nobody does this job for the money. They do it because they love it. And this really is a dream job come true. I'm a, oh, I do it for the money. Are you kidding me? 100 grand? <laughs> I, I, give, I give my left leg for 100 grand. And I know. Yeah, so someone said that. They go, would you work for a cigarette company? I'm like, absolutely not. They're like, would you do it for 200000 a year? I'm like, well, keep talking. <laughs> Every, everybody has yeah, their I, price. Everybody has their price. But no, it's the, we talked about earlier about negative campaigning and the lies. It's going to be huge in this election. So you're going to have people say all sorts of things about me. They took a lot of shots at my family before, which you know, my father, I think, actually backfired on him because people know him. It's hard in a local race to do very negative campaigning when you know the person. And it was this size, too. Yeah. Because if somebody came to me and was like, oh, Tim's the worst guy in the world, and I'm like, well, I know him. He's not that bad of a guy. Like, well, you don't know me that well. You know, <laughs> all, all the negative stuff falls. So negative campaigning is what you do when you're losing. I mean, there's always an aspect of, you know, I never went negative on Josh. I just compared it. I said, look, if he's elected mayor, Crystal Spring will go through. And I think for an election piece, I'll say this. Nothing's been built on Crystal Spring right now. The project is itself the plan, which was commercial, the size of the Harbor Center, the townhouse, the end of the spot. That's all been killed and gone away. Now it's just the senior Lutheran facility. If I wasn't elected mayor, they'd be out there right now with chainsaws chopping down trees. And that's not a scare tactic or fear tactic. That's the truth. And if you had a change of administration, someone who said, I care about jobs more than I care about the environment. You can have a mayor come in there and say, we're going to start tomorrow because the executive has a tremendous amount of power. And I think that is going to come into the election, which is if you look at what I've done between Preserve at Parkside, Crystal Spring, the upturning and the ha- housing authority where three million dollars went to the wrong person. I've upset a lot of people. And there's a lot of people who do not want to see me as mayor. And there's hundreds of millions of dollars that I've held up. So, yeah, there's definitely going to be money influence of people who are like, we want Mike Cantalese out there and we want somebody in there who's going to necessarily do what I want but be more open to it. So I'm looking for a lot of outside money coming in. They did it last time. I think it was Martin O'Malley's Super PAC gave money to my opponent. So there'll be a lot of outside influences of people coming in. Well, I think, yeah, and to that point, too, the outside influences when we're talking about the negative campaign wasn't coming from you or Josh, really. It was coming from, you know, with social media taking such a big role in Huge. everything, yep. including elections. And you saw at the national election that it's easy to to have a lot of negative influences from outside. You know, I'm getting tired of the phrase fake news, but, um, you know, certainly 
before it was called fake news. Mm-hmm. Apple is doing it before fake news was cool. But I mean, you, <laughs> you, you had a lot of that anonymous uh, slings and arrows yeah. that that weren't orchestrated in any any formal way, but were given kind of tacit approval by not calling it out. And it really ups- it really disturbed me. The level, you know, Scott Bowling, who since passed away, mm-hmm. um, he was a really good guy, and, and he was doing everything for the right reasons. Yep. And, and he, you know, he was getting death threats. You know, and the worst part is everyone knew where it was coming from. Everyone knew what was happening, and no one was condemning it. And that, that really upset a lot of people. A lot you know, of crocodile think. tears yeah, were shed. And everything yeah, exactly. Else well. And I think that uh, you know, uh, I, I was not disheartened by the way the last election ran. You know, as far as as uh, negativity, you know, and I don't, I don't foresee it yeah. coming up, you know, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's social, like you said, you know, a lot of the campaigns be on social media, and it just, that is still, social media is still relatively young. It's five years old since it's gone mainstream. Hey, as, as we wrap up, um, one thing we, when we talked to Senator Astle, we asked him where all of his best and worst decisions started from, and they all started in bars, it seems, <laughs> in Annapolis. He said the Red Coach Inn, which isn't existing anymore. He mentioned Harry Browns when he was mm-hmm. uh, first told to uh, run for mayor way back in the 80s, I guess it was. Yeah. So 81. So where – what? 81. Yeah. So where 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 do where do all and sort of a shout out to the Annapolis podcast, but where do, where do all of your good or bad decisions happen here in town? Hmm. I got to think about that for that, a second. That that would be Brewster's ice cream. <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> so I think a lot of it's come from the public. You know, when I started, well, off, I want to know where you go and, and these uh, ideas. Come well, no, let me say this about we did a citizens <laughs> transition team, which was different. We had two hundred people applied. It wasn't normally here's all your friends and all your donors. It was. Most of the people I never met before and never knew, they all applied and we put them on there. I'd say, you know, people coming from open door sessions, people have great ideas all the time and from the public. For me, I, don't, I mean, the gym at home, I don't I don't have, like, a place I go so, to, so to, like, there's, meditate. There, there, there's, there's no, like, bar stool at, at Red Bull Wine Bar or someplace yeah. where, where, you, where you sat down there and somebody said, you know, Mike, you really should run for governor, or you should, you know, or you, you really yeah, should run for um, mayor. Where did, where, where did the mayor think of? Was it Dave Cordell when you were carrying around that, that cruddy old pipe during the <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, for running for mayor, you know, I always had a passion for politics, and then supporting Dave and managing his race was a big part of it. But no, I don't, I don't know. I think the bars are probably where some of the worst ideas have come from. And we were joking <laughs> about the market house, and we was like, what's the, the worst thing or stupidest thing someone's ever said to you? And I'm like, well, you know, there's no such thing as a stupid comment or question. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I'll write a book after I'm done. The book of bad ideas. But um, yeah, somebody was like, you know what you should do in the market house? The only way it's going to make money, you should put slots in there. And someone said a medical marijuana dispensary. And I'm like, okay, thanks for your suggestion. <laughs> and kind of moved on nicely. There you go. But I don't know if we touched on in this podcast. I know we did in the last one, but just saying that the market house has been open every day. There's fried chicken, oysters, and they go down there. So shameless plug for the market house. That's right. We're going to do something about you know, the pizza Harvey's right? done pretty yeah. well on that. We the, chicken is, the chicken is good. The he brought back the original good. guy to do the recipe. Uh, did he really? He I did. mean, I know that he bought yeah. a special steamer when there was the big uh, threat of uh, Royal Farms coming in next door yeah. here to Stevens. He was like, oh, grapes, we got to uh, No, he brought know, the we, guy we that had it before. Yeah, yeah. So I remember Kevin giving me a sample of it. But, oh, gosh, you know, thank you very much. We've monopolized an awful lot of your time in the last couple weeks. I appreciate Appreciate you coming down. And we're going to have you and all the candidates. We're going to we want to do something like we did with that uh, Twitter debate. But we're going to do something uh, a little live different. Stream, we're going to do some live streaming stuff and it. recorded this uh, and everything else. And, and uh, we're gonna, as the we're going to have you on again. We're going to have uh, whoever's left standing on the other side. We're going to have them on as we get closer because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of things that are you know once the campaigns are built and once the, once the platforms are built that that you're going to want to talk more in depth specific. So you're always welcome back if you'll come back. And we're extending that to anyone else who's running for uh, any office within uh, the city or anywhere within Maryland. If you want a, a platform, you're more than welcome to come on our podcast and discuss it. Um, we'd love to it. have you. Yep. And you can find us here at themarylandcrabs.com if you're online. You can go to iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio and search for The Maryland Crab. And subscribe. Please. Please subscribe so it goes right to your phone and rate us. Uh, give us a five-star rating. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at MD Crabs Podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, we said email. Facebook is the Maryland Crabs. We've got a page and a group. And if you want to do it personally, I am at I on Annapolis, and that's E-Y-E. And Tim is at Tim Hamilton 47 because he was 47 three or four years ago. Um, You're an ass. And that's about it. But um, candidate Mike Panelides, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. This has been a lot of fun, a lot of insight. Good luck in the campaign. I think uh, – I still stand by uh, my assertion that I think you're going to be a formidable candidate. I don't think it was a, a necessarily a 
flash in, I can make up words, um, a flash in the pan. And I think, uh, you know, part of it that, that you, you, you haven't screwed up anything is, is probably going to go a long way. I mean, it's not, not a great endorsement, but I think. Uh, yeah, that's not going to be the campaign. Yeah, story. that's it. Yeah. You know, we'll work on that. Yeah, how bad could it be? <laughs> it could be worse. You know? <laughs> that's, 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 that's right. But uh, we look forward to having you again. So thanks for coming on, Mr. Mayor. Of course. John, right. Tim, thanks so much for having me. All right, great. This has been the Maryland Crabs Podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now, get the hell out of my kitchen. Seriously, go! You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.